by way of introduction, I'm a CPA. I have my own firm. I've been doing it for about 12, about 12 years. Graduated from Rutgers 13 years ago, 2010. And I was sitting right where you guys are just 13 years ago. And it's pretty crazy to me to be here. So I'm super excited about that part. And I'm super excited about the fact that I get to be here, you know, during tax season, which is a little bit challenging, but to help you guys guide you guys in the career and your goals and kind of help you navigate what I remember feeling like when I was sitting in your position. And I want to start by saying, and I, and I, I want to start by saying this. A lot of times, like when I was in your shoes, you know, you're thinking about what major to major in, what you want to do for the rest of your life, but you're sitting here and it's hard to envision that. And I can tell you that from my experience, the path is very windy. Whatever major you choose to, today to do, whatever it is that you end up majoring in or that you think you're going to do, it's going to pivot and it's going to change. And I want to just give you guys an example again, just because I remember sitting there and it was a very similar experience and I wanted to share it with you guys. When I started at Rutgers in 2006, I actually wanted to do finance. Then I actually got my EMT license and decided that I actually want to do pre-med. So I decided no more business school track. Well, back then, business school was a two-year two program. So it was junior and senior year. And freshman and sophomore year was like the general school of sciences. And you just had to get your prerequisites, then you can apply. So I decided I wanted to do pre-med, went into pre-med, and started taking those classes, and quickly realized that I'm awful at science. And that was a horrible idea. So then I had to change course and I ended up going back to business, but I wanted to do finance. The problem was I went to do the pre-med classes and I got like C's in them and B's because I was not good at science. Then I had to really quickly catch up. So my grades got my GPA up. Then I went to get, and I minored in psychology and my one class, abnormal psychology. I got, I was given a C in the class when I really had an A because it was just a mix up with another student. But the reason I tell you this is that little mix up with the C and the A dropped my GPA so low that I didn't qualify for the business school at all. So my only option was economics at the time, which was not part of the business school, or switch to either Newark or Camden Rutgers to, to do the, the major. So I had to, I rushed basically, got it all fixed, but we updated my grade. But by then basically finance was all full and the only thing left was accounting. So I pursued that route. I went into accounting. I got to enjoy it a little bit over the time. But I raise a show of hands. How many of you guys are in accounting? Major, majors. Okay, cool. Finance? Cool. Supply chain? Marketing? All right, cool. Nice. Awesome. So yeah, so the minority I could see here is accounting, similar to, to me back then. Although it's interesting, back then there was a lot more accountants. And I'm actually very curious to pick your brains a little later about what you know what made you kind of desire to do the, the finance route but or the other ones but in short story is is after doing that and i got into accounting and i started enjoying it more so went through with it got my first internship that then got canceled on me basically within two weeks after getting accepted and of course which was about a week after all the on-campus interviewing and all that stuff was done so basically my options were Pretty much limited, so I ended up just tutoring that summer. And the whole reason I tell you guys this story is not so you feel bad for me, but it's really because the point was that I wanted to do finance, didn't happen because of like this grade, the grade thing and my pre-med sidetracked. I wanted to get into an internship. I didn't get into the internship because it got canceled. I had to do like I had to do tutoring. At the time, all my colleagues, all the people, all the other classmates were all getting internships, getting real life experience. And I felt like I was behind and I was never going to get a job. Then I graduated 2010. Most of you guys know there was the, that, you know, economic downturn. Not a lot of firms were even hiring. So I finally got that one job with McGladry. Anybody here at McGladry? RSM? Maybe? Yeah. In the accounting world. So yeah, I was super excited about it. It was in the city. Super stoked. And then a week before graduation, they pulled the offer and delayed it a year. So then I ended up going into the master's program and got my master's in tax. But the whole point being here is you pivot, right? And the main reason here, this is a career 
kind of task task that you guys have an assignment right to figure out you know career wise and and set goals so set goals for yourselves day with what you can imagine what you think the career would be and then be ready and always be ready to pivot and when those things happen like that canceled cancellation of a of my internship or the delay of a year in my finally full-time offer all those things kind of sucked at the time but looking back at it now you know it just kind of shape me to just roll with the roll with the punches as they say so to then fast forward a little bit i finally after a year got my masters i then actually quit mcgladry i didn't end up starting with them i started with cbiz just to get an internship while i was going to my masters program and then i jumped around about seven firms in the public accounting world and until i realized none of it was for me and i had to open up my own accounting firm so the fun cpa is my brand i am 150 percent into that brand because as i could see from the raise of hands of how many are people are in accounting there's a reason there was about like five and the reason is because the industry has a, a pretty crappy reputation a lot of it stems from you know high hours low pay and boring and i'm trying to single-handedly to make it not boring and to make it exciting to make it fun to make it about the people that are in it the stuff that i enjoyed I do it through my own firm, but I never imagined it would be after like 12 years or after however long it was. I just pictured in my mind, I was like, if I make it partner, which is like that coveted status in the public accounting world, I'll be happy. And, you know, but it was never working out for me. And I jumped around to try to find the perfect firm, but then ended up in my own. So the reason why I say that, you know, now, now basically once I got out of my own, it changed my perspective as to what I can and can't do because you're kind of limited sometimes when you're in the, the job world. Now I, I have a podcast. I was a YouTube channel I'm doing a lot of that, those kinds of things that are in like the 21st century, which many accountants are surprised by. But that's my main, you know, my main kind of thing about, about career goals. And that's why I kind of wanted to start it because that is the assignment. So as you kind of consider where you want to be in your you know, life and, and, and where you want to end up career wise, remember that it does change. It does pivot, but I always recommend, and I was just in Rutgers Newark last week doing a very similar presentation, but I just want to tell you guys that, you know, many, how many of you guys like are thinking entrepreneurial, think, want to have your own company? Okay, good. And I, and what I told last week as well, and I'll say it again now too, is I firmly believe in at least having some experience, you know, having a job, a full-time job for two, three years before you fully jump into the entrepreneurship world. And the reason for that, in my experience at least, is that when I, uh, when I had that experience, I mean, for me, it was 12 years, but I was able to see what I liked and what I didn't like about the way that those firms or, or those companies were, were handling themselves with clients, with staff and things of that nature. So having that job for the first two, three years, definitely helped me in many ways, but it helped me specifically see what I didn't want to do in my own firm. So that's kind of the quick gist there. I had a lot of questions in last week when I was at Newark, so I kind of wanted to see if maybe I could, you know, gauge and see if you guys had any questions. And if you do, I can kind of pivot the conversation into wherever you guys would vision. <laughs> Until then, why, why, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So from my experience and, and, and with me specifically, it was it worked out well for me for the 12 years that I spent in public accounting because well, one, I grew my own knowledge, right? So I learned about taxes. I, I, my specialty was tax, high net worth people and their businesses that they owned. And, um, you know, that helped me have that base to feel comfortable with pretty much 95% of the clients that I have now. And I also was very specific in how I choose the clients. 
now, especially now, you know, I, I will kind of have the conversation. If it seems like it's too complicated for me, I'll probably end up referring them to one of those firms just because I don't have those resources. But, you know, interesting, it's interesting you say about job security because it's like it's what I call the golden handcuffs. You know, when you're working somewhere and you get that paycheck, I was making one hundred and fifty thousand right when I left to go out on my own, which is a decent amount of money, I would say. And I also had my son who was who was three years old at the time. He's now four. You know, when you have like when you have the kids and you have that, you know, the health insurance that you need for them and all those things, everything was in my name, you know, to then have to have my wife kind of step up a little bit and, you know, take some of that you know, responsibility that I had before on herself to adjust. But you have to do that. One of the things that I that helped me is we also had a, a pretty decent amount of savings as well. So I think it was multi part. Like I'm not the kind of person that would have left or, or quit or whatever with, you know, $10,000 saved up and no plan. So to me, it was, let me save up enough money so I feel comfortable, even if I don't make money at all for six months, you know, to a year, I was okay with that, you know. But the thing is, for me, what I did was I actually utilized the relationships that I've had in the, in the public accounting space. And what I did was I actually ended up contracting with a, a large firm in the, in the North Jersey area. I ended up contracting with them. That gave me steady monthly income around 5000 or so a month, which was like, okay, I can start building my firm the way I want with that security. So, like, yeah. The biggest lesson, uh, honestly, that I think I learned out of all the pivots and everything is just be ready to make the adjustment, you know? don't dwell on the L's, you don't dwell on your losses, right? Because I could have sat there and been like, oh man, my internship got canceled and done nothing about it, you know, and just been like, well, you know, that really sucks and just kind of sat there and, and been upset about it. Then I kind of, you know, bounced back, finally got that job offer. By the way, I probably applied. I have emails, it's funny, I have emails in my, in my Gmail to going back in like 2010, 20, whatever it was, 2000, early 2011. I was just emailing like local CPAs at that time, just asking for a job because the market was down and even the bigger firms, I mean, they pretty much most of them have had selected some of the people with the higher GPAs or whatever it was. And I finally got that job with McLadry to only been canceled on me for, you know, delayed for a year. So again, I could have been like, oh man, like, okay, I guess I'll wait a year, you know, but I was like, no, I'll do my master's now because I had to get the 150 anyway. So it's just pivoting. So I think, you know, to answer your question, really, it's just accept the fact that some things may not work out how you envision and just be ready to roll with it. Because to me, what I learned the most out of my experience is that it's the connections that you have, the people that you get to know over the time that will actually dictate where your career will go. You know, people that I've met 10 years ago in one my, in my, of my first jobs in Miami, actually, was where I started my career. You know, when those people have actually been sending me clients and sending me and just being like, hey, I love your content that you're doing, stuff like that. Just, you know, why don't you do this return or, or why don't you help out with this client for me? So it's, it truly really just makes its way around. It's never what I envisioned it to be. It just takes its turns and you just got to be ready to adjust with it. A great question. I think I saw someone else raise their hand on that side. No? You? Oh, yeah. When I was at the big firms, I was a manager. I probably had a team of about eight people between a few engagements that I managed. So from the perspective of, you know, like managing my time, it was a little bit easier because I had the help. I'll say we've got 15, 20 tax returns that, that I'm assigned to or that they're assigned to. You know, what's the time that when you guys think you'll get it done, I'll review it and whatever. So I had a little bit more flexibility now, you know, and, and this is as current as today, I'm looking at my list of my own clients. I got 95 clients that I got to do. You know, now at this point I'm down to, I think about 40, 45, but I also got three weeks left, you know, and the way it works out, you got these staggered deadlines, March 15th being businesses and April 15th being individuals. And so it's just all on you. After tax season, I, I have the, the most flexibility and I have the ability to do whatever I want. I'm big into boating, um, so I enjoy doing that in the summertime. But when it gets a little bit more 
crunch. You know, it's really all me, but I am looking to also hire eventually, probably probably a little bit later this year, just to prepare for next season because that was a little wild. I also have a three-month-old at home, which is adding to the fun, and also a four-year-old. And listen, you again, having to come out here, if I was working for someone, I probably would never have the time because, you know, there's just nobody checking in on you, which is good and bad. So you just have to be like super disciplined, I think is really what the, the underlying message is. A great question. Yeah. So that's really good. And, and I think to that point, there's a few things that I will tell you. I am very strong about like word of mouth. So to me, word of mouth, and I know it's a little bit more on like the old school side, like because I do the posting, I do the Instagram stuff. I post a lot on LinkedIn. And side note, how many of you guys are on LinkedIn? Nice. All right, good. LinkedIn, I'll get to that in a second. It's a very powerful tool. Just the reach of that is unreal. But so to go back, I post a lot on LinkedIn. I have a decent, decent amount of followers. I'm not, you know, super famous. But, you know, I have enough followers from the, the whole country. But my focus on LinkedIn, for example, as a strategy point, is I do a lot of value posting, post about tax things, post about whatever, you know, lifestyle things and whatever it is. Not in the goal of getting a client from LinkedIn, but in the goal of connecting with like a financial advisor, a mortgage broker, a real estate professional, something along those lines that will then have a conversation with me that otherwise I'd never be able to reach, right, if it wasn't for LinkedIn. And now they know what kind of clients I'm looking for. And that, to answer your question, is where I'd probably say about 30, 35 to 40% of my business comes from that, like kind of LinkedIn, social media, YouTube, like, you know, one person saw like my YouTube episode about, about real estate or whatever it was. And they were like, hey, you know, went to my website and reached out to me. That was a $4,000 client. I mean, you know, again, so, so the, the power of technology is certainly there, but I rely, and I rely on, the, on my current clients and the ones that I've had. I rely on them kind of spreading the message. And the reason for that is because my minimum fee is pretty high because I focus on value instead of a volume practice. So my minimum fee is 1500 even for like the most basic return. So what that does is it eliminates people that wanted the cheaper returns and it gives me the higher value, you know, wealthier business owners, things of that nature. And now if somebody refers, you know, somebody that's my client says to their friend, they go, hey, you know, Yuri is awesome. Like you should, you know, you should definitely use them. There is no negotiating on the price at that point, right? Because they're told, hey, this guy's great. This is what I pay. And if that person is like, okay, cool, then I don't have to negotiate about, you know, the fee. So that's in part why, why word of mouth tends to be a little bit stronger for me. And then again, if it comes from, and then from the LinkedIn side, if it comes from a trusted referral or a trusted advisor of that client, of, that, of a person, and it's like their financial advisor who says, forget about your old CPA, use him, that also comes with a lot of trust. So when you have somebody reach out to you cold, like off of like a, a DM or something like that on, on Instagram, it's not, it's not going to translate as well, you know, because they might be like, oh, well, that's too high for me. You know what I mean? Like they might see the value, but not be willing to pay value. So hopefully does that answer your question? All right, cool. Awesome. I, have a, I actually am picking your brains a little bit. Raise your hand again for accounting majors. I think it was like mostly on this side of the room, right? Okay, cool. Is anybody here, this is like kind of a very specific question, but is anybody here like, thought about accounting, but then ended up picking one of the other majors that you guys said. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. Okay. Why, what made you switch? Please do. Okay. So I was awesome. just like, I think that looking at my future, like, I don't need to do this. Like, I don't need to get that. Yeah. It's like the goal that I want. Like, I had this dream of being a teacher. Awesome. So, that's kind of why I chose to do it. Yeah. I appreciate that. And that's, that's good transparency and good disclosure. Because I think that there's, so there's like a, I don't know if you've probably heard of it, there's like a big shortage of accountants. There's a big CPA shortage. A lot of people attribute that to a few things, 150 credits that some people just simply don't want to get. The discrepancy, and I think that it plays into the finance role, the discrepancy between pay 
Like when you graduate finance, you can go into investment banking and make what I made, what I made 12 years after 150 on day one. I mean, that's crazy. You know, I mean, I think salaries now in the accounting world have gone up tremendously from when I started. I started at 51,000. They're probably, I think, 75. So a little bit more than inflation from then. But that's a great point. And by the way, if you, you know, I will tell you that no matter what major, which is what I kind of started with saying, no matter what major you choose, again, relationships, the people that you meet along the way, I've seen many people, many of my friends, switch from accounting to finance and switch from finance to accounting. Just like that, you know, it, it, which again is the point of it doesn't dictate anything. You just got to graduate to get that building block. And sometimes you might think, oh my God, this is completely not what I envisioned finance to be. But great answer. Who else was the one that someone else said that they had wanted to do accounting, but then changed their mind? Uh, now everybody got shy, I see. All right. Oh, yeah? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, I don't think I'd be accepted in the accounting world. Like, first, and then I went to my academic advisor. She's like, well, you have all your prerequisites for marketing. I'm like, oh, well, then that's it. Yeah, that's awesome. Interesting. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because, well, this you said you graduated oh six. So yeah, and I think even then, like people, like the old school was still. Have, heavy in the accounting world too. They probably came like suits and ties and, you know, like super probably pocket protector. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I'm trying to change. This is what I'm out here doing, but myself in my, in my own world of, of, you know, of, of wildness. But yeah, that's what, you know, to pursue that and, and to push the industry the way I am on LinkedIn, my posts are pretty controversial for, for purposes of, of accountants, you know, and, and pushing the boundaries to, to have them change their mind you know, involved with the CPA, AICPA, NJCPA, and just trying to shift that needle into making the industry more exciting, more fun. I think eventually you have to choose something. And again, my, my whole point in saying it's like, it's, it's tough to choose in your role. Like you're, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. Like you don't know what, you don't know what you want to do in life yet. Like you have an idea and a concept. But a lot of interest, like you said, like, you know, I, in my, if everything didn't happen with the grades and all that, I would have been in finance. I probably would have been all right. You know, I, I don't know if I would have had my, obviously not my own firm in accounting, but I would have done something different in finance. My brother is in finance. He also graduated from Rutgers, you know, and he is working for HelloFresh now to figure out what interests are. And, and especially, and remember in accounting, I didn't get into accounting because I had this amazing interest in it. I got into it because that was literally the only thing that was open after my whole grade mishap of, you know, my C turn, you know, my A turned to a C and then back to an A, finance was full, accounting was open. I was like, cool, I don't, I don't really know anything about accounting, but it sounds great. Then once I got into it, I did like all the couple internships and then like those volunteer income tax preparation stuff that they do. And I had Professor Leonard Goodman, who I heard recently he actually passed away, unfortunately, it was very sad, but he was like my main role, my main reason for being super excited about individual tax that was what he taught here so yeah so that was kind of what got me once i picked it i was like okay this is cool let me just go with that so yeah so the short answer is i think you know what, what's your major now free business okay cool cool yeah awesome so yeah you know pursue that and i think i truly don't believe that that classes like that the classes you take most of them don't translate to real world a lot of times like calculus i have not done calculus i don't even really know how to do calculus anymore you know i don't you know statistics i've taken it with zatrowski i don't know if he's still teaching here he had like a really long beard is he still teaching here no okay cool i'm dating myself then but i don't use any statistics so you know like but the point is you you get through it right because in your mind you're like i will enjoy it when i'm working like that's where you get the most amount of experience knowledge and all that and if when you graduate with whatever you end up choosing, you don't like the work side of it. First of all, being 22, 23, 24, you can always switch, go back to school, learn something else, or you'll learn or you meet someone, you know, in the field or whatever it is, that's gonna be like, oh, hey, I know this person in finance and they're looking for someone with an accounting degree. And then all of a sudden you're doing finance there. 
it's really, that's how it has worked for many people that I've known in my career who didn't want to do accounting anymore or vice versa that wanted to come into accounting. Mm. <laughs> yep. And we, or sometimes we do know our long term goal, like for instance, play on accounting. I want to be a partner at whatever firm. Yeah. We know your goal too, and we need steps. So maybe we need to come up with this perfect plan and it's going to be from A to Z. And then wherever on, I don't know what alphabet you're going to <laughs> But hopefully you're sticking with it. So let's say point A to point Z. Yeah. Sitting here in front of you, you know, teaching a business law class. I would have told you, you're absolutely nuts. I figured I'd be at home right now with my hair and I'm doing mom running, <laughs> making porridge for the 10 kids that I got. That's, that's what my, that was my goal, right? That was our goal. So don't beat yourself up. You can do the same thing. Yeah. Um, but I highly encourage you. And, you know, uh, you know, another great point, and we talked about too, your network is your network. Talk to people. Talk to people within the industry. Maybe talk to people outside of the industry that you didn't think of, but really put yourself out there. It's super uncomfortable. So start getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. And to that point, which is, I was going to touch on that, LinkedIn. So let me just go back to LinkedIn. As a student, LinkedIn is honestly one of the most powerful things, one of the most powerful platforms out there. And, you know, you can look, first of all, you can look around and you can just learn about an industry, right? You can just learn about accounting from people who post about accounting things, right? Because the problem nowadays, which you also mentioned with passion and being like kind of blinded by it, you go to like TikTok and Instagram and all these social media things that show you a, a, a freaking 30 second clip of what a day in the life of a, a multi-billion dollar real estate investor is, Grant Cardone, you know, or Gary Vaynerchuk or whatever it is. And you are like, that's what I want to do. You know, that's my passion. But it's like a 30 second clip and that's it, right? You don't really know what, it, what it's like. And that's why it's important to go through those ranks a little bit and to have that, those pivots and things of like that in life to get there. And it blinds you sometimes for that role. But LinkedIn, so how many of you guys are seniors? Or seniors, okay, cool. Juniors? All right, so juniors, seniors, and even sophomores. I'll give you a great example as to how you can utilize LinkedIn in, in a really awesome way. Let's just say you've got an, an, an opportunity to interview for whatever internship, whether it's in finance, marketing, supply chain, whatever it is with some company out there. You hop on LinkedIn and you can start, you know, just seeing who works there, maybe locally, maybe even, you know, in New Brunswick area, New Jersey, somewhere, Clifton, whatever it is. You can message them. Worst case scenario, they say no. A best case scenario, maybe you get a lunch with them before your interview or you just have a quick phone call with them before your interview, now you get a little bit of insight into the company itself that you're gonna interview at. And one of the things when I was interviewing students or other professionals switching, whatever it was, you know, one of the main things obviously at the end of the interview that they're gonna to say to you, do you have any questions? And the worst thing you could do is have no questions, right? Because that says that you didn't look into the company, you didn't you know, do your homework, right? So. As far as questions now, if you have had a little bit of that insight with somebody, you might now be, you might look like you're so proactive that you've gone beyond just the regular website of that company. Now you know, oh, hey, you know, I heard you guys are doing this initiative internally for blah, blah, blah. And you know, can you speak more about that? And all you gotta do is just get them to get the interviewer to talk more about themselves or, or about the firm and you're, and you're good. And one of the other things I'm gonna leave you with, if you wanna jot this down, just because it has worked for me for the seven firms I've jumped as a good question, if you have nothing else to ask, at the end of the interview when they say, do you have any questions? What I usually say is, I'll, you know, I'm looking at whatever partner it is and, and, or whoever I'm speaking to and say, hey, you know, I can see that you're really successful and you've made a really nice career at this firm. And as somebody who's new, who's coming into this company, you know, what qualities are you looking for for somebody who is to be as successful as you are? And now you've opened it up for them to talk about themselves, 
and when people talk about themselves, they tend to they tend to associate you with good things. Like because you've allowed them to talk about themselves, they feel good about themselves. But you were there asking that question. It's a weird psychology thing. But anyway, so it's a good question to to ask. To you know, in case you have nothing else, and and it's you know towards the end of the interview. So the question, and I'm going to repeat it because it's a very interesting question, very great question too. How has technology influenced the way accounting, you know, the way I do the accounting, the way even Excel functions or tax return preparation or whatever it is? So even over my career of 12 years, what's interesting is that a lot of things, a lot of things have changed. But I'll give you the most classic thing that changed, which is OCR, our optical character recognition, and PDFs. So there's software out there now, like one of them, for example, called like Gruntworks, where basically you take a client's documents, whether you, you know, if they, if they send it to you PDF, you just literally take that PDF, put it into this platform. It knows all the standard documents, like W2s, 1090, all that crap, and then scans it all in and puts it in the return for you. Like you don't have to put a single number in there. Now, obviously that costs money and there is a fundamental aspect of organizing the information. And especially when you're getting the documents like by hand, it's very annoying because then you got to scan it in and then put it, but 10 seconds tops. And the return is, again, it's not ideal, but it's prepared. And I think that that part is huge. Like I actually don't use it just because like, most of my clients, like especially if they're sending a piecemeal, whatever, like, listen, we're talking about 15 documents at most. You know, I can, I can do that. And usually it'll take me on average two to three hours for tax return. On a given, what's that? Two to three hours, and depending on the return. Like if it's like if it's my client's kid who has a W two, you know that's probably going to be like half an hour. So I weigh that option. I think probably increasing that technology. Some of the other technology out there is outsourcing, uh, which I'm sure you guys are hearing a lot about. Outsourcing and accounting is huge. VAs. I think I'm going to get one this year. Virtual assistants from either you know the Philippines or or India or whatever it is. The main challenge there in the accounting space is privacy of information, right? You're dealing with tax, you're dealing with tax returns, financials, you're dealing with socials, dates of birth, all the identifying documentation that could potentially be not so great for you if you know it was to be used maliciously. If, and it's hard, it's hard to find someone who you know who you know for sure can trust and everything unless someone else is using them. But that's a really good question. Yeah. So I've been doing this stuff on the side for four years uh, before I fully left on my own. So, but I think I had about probably ten to fifteen thousand dollars of like income on the side because it's really hard when you're working 70, 70 hours, 60, 70 hours a week for the firm, and on top of that, having those clients be like, "Hey, where's my tax return?" You know, and having to work some weeks eighty to get all that stuff done. So it's interesting, I'll tell you a quick story on, on that. So my, my, in my mind, my goal was this. I was gonna quit my job the moment I was able to get a client, my client base to 50,000 for tax season. I was, at, I was at 10, 15 or so. So I wanted to get to 50 and I was like, when I get to 50, I'm, I'm done. Because I was like, 50 is enough for me to quit in November, set up my processes, and that January to, to, to April, I would make 50 grand and then I would be my starting point. The problem was that I could never get, I could never get to that 50 because the time it would take for me to work on, on $50,000 worth of clients would be just too much, it would be practically impossible. I could barely get over the $15,000 like hump. So what ended up happening was one of my friends, one, again, well, like I said, the connections that you've had, one of the friends that, and who used to be a, a, a staff at one of the firms that I worked at, went out on his own and then decided he doesn't want to do accounting anymore and was, came to me and said, hey, would you want to buy my firm? He, and, and he only wanted to carve out $100,000 worth of work to me. And I was like, perfect. That would be a great starting point, $100,000. I'll pay him back over time. But long story short is he was in a partnership and he offered it to me. I was like, oh my, this is awesome. Like, this is going to happen. And literally... Three days after I gave notice, banking on that 100000 his partner sued him. And was basically like, D you can't give away $100,000 of our partnership income. Because, and you know, and to him, he just partnered up with him a year ago. 
So basically that was the, the little thing. He, in his mind, it was like, this is my clients. I can give them to you. But the partnership agreement said he could not. And see, he got sued. Long story short, I did not get a single dollar of that $100,000 thing, but I still quit. Like I still gave notice. I ended up just going with it anyway. Never looked back because, you know, once you're out there, once you don't have that security anymore, that's when I was like, okay, so I'm going to go and I'm going to start, you know, finding a contracting job. I started going to the city three days a week to just get some money. I was making probably about a thousand, fifteen hundred 1500 a month doing that. It was something. And then you start grinding and then you start building. So, so yeah, we're, good question. Any other questions? So, all right. If there's no other questions, thanks, guys. I appreciate you guys taking the time. <laughs>